Welcome to this week's episode of Claw Combos. We have a very special guest, our older brother, Thomas Dunn, and I think this completes the Dunn sibling on Claw Combos today. Yeah, welcome, Thomas. Thank you guys for having me, finally. <laughs> we saved the best for last. Hey guys, this is Sheila and Maya Dunn, and you're listening to Claw Combos. <laughs> Jumping right in, um, Thomas, could you give a brief kind of background about what you've been up to? This episode will be a little bit um, different than some of the others in the sense that we have a unique perspective in the legal field and also some entrepreneurial background. So could you kind of just give a brief intro to yourself? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm currently a, a, an attorney in New York. Uh, I work for a firm called Scadden. Um, doing investment management work. We do everything from fund formation um, to ongoing regulatory issues, fundraising, uh, and, and typically represent the sponsor, the, the manager who kind of takes in the capital and, and um, you know, tries to make more. But at times we also represent the investors. Um, that's what I'm up to. I went to, to NYU for law school, University of Florida for undergrad. When I finished uh, up at Florida, I started a business that we ran for two years um, before I, I focused fully on, on law school. Do you work with like hedge funds that are doing this whole stock thing right now? With no, we don't work with Melvin. Update. It's absolutely nuts. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also like, I was telling Lisa, it's literally free money. If we're willing to ride the wave, you can just short that stock. It's like... It, Quite, Chris, Chris disagrees with me. I, would talk I don't know how he does. What? Yeah, he was talking to me last night about it. About what I said? Yeah, he doesn't disagree per se. Well, first of all, we would, I would have doubled my money on day one that I yeah. told him. I said, we need to short it today. And then we would have doubled our money the next day. But also, I'm just, I just say to Chris, it's like, the company is worth $10 a share. And it's trading at 500 it literally is a it's an it's an accidental mismatch being intentionally driven up by the rando retail investor cool and they're going to put out the you know they're going to put these hedge funds out of business fine but the stock has to come down it cannot okay. stay you know what i mean it's literally not worth that much money if the bank if the company ended and gave money to the stockholders it would be ten dollars a share it would be 500 you know what i mean yeah. People can't hold on to the shit forever. Right. Yeah. But anyway, it could potentially cost you a shit ton of money to hold on to it. Well, and if you bet, if you do options and you bet the stock's going down, you could lose money first and then make it, right? Yeah. Options, you don't lose money. But if you shorted it and it kept going up, oh. yeah, you could lose money in the short term. And, then and I, so, I mean, that's the issue. There's 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 unlimited liability when you short a stock, which is why Melvin Capital is screwed, um, or or it was getting screwed. But <laughs> we'll see. It's interesting stuff. I'm I was gonna to say that. that if you said, "What would you tell yourself in high school?" I I wrote down. Well, wrote down Bitcoin and GameStop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, that's good. Um, nice. So just quickly getting back on track here regarding, okay, so you went to UF undergrad and then your college decision to go to NYU was like kind of a big topic discussed in our family of how you chose your college. So do you think choosing NYU was um, critical in your like now current role at Skadden? I think going to NYU law was pivotal and, and necessary. Um, <clears throat> I am a good, but not as good of student as the rest of the Duns. Um, and going to NYU for law school, which is a bit more recognized and has a, a national brand and can get you in, uh, in, in the doors at, at a lot of the top law firms, was absolutely essential. 
Um, because in order to do that and get in the door at the top firms from uh, a less well-known school um, or one that's maybe more uh, regionally recognized, um, you really need to be like the top student or the top few students in the class. Um, and I was honest with myself before law school in that I, I probably was not going to be the top, you know, 1%. I might be in the top 10%, but I wasn't going to be at the absolute top of my class, um, no matter how hard I was going to work. And I probably wasn't going to work hard enough to, um, to be there. So, and I had, I was fortunate. I was working for a law firm at the time as a legal assistant. And I had, I had gotten into university of Florida where I had gone for undergrad and university of Southern, Southern California, um, both with considerable financial incentives. Um, and then I got the NYU admission with really none. Um, but I was working for this attorney that was like, you have to go to NYU. You don't say no to, you know, a top 10 law firm. It's it, in law. It's, they kind of call it T14. Um, where kind of the 14 best schools have a monopoly almost on getting the best jobs. And beyond that, um, you know, 15, 16, 17, they're still outstanding schools, but they typically place more people, um, you know, in the state, in the state in which they're located or um, at smaller firms, which might be your goal. And if that's your goal, then certainly take into account the um, financial incentives you get to to a school that might be a little lower down on your um, on the ranking list, if you will. But um, he, I had that perspective from him and that was extremely helpful in making my my call. Did you always in terms of your goals, like did you always know you wanted to work at a top law firm in New York City or has that evolved over time? That's definitely evolved. I, I was I was quite naive about the legal market. I went to law school thinking that I would definitely start um, my own firm at some point. Um, but I quickly learned that that's not, I really had no idea how the legal market worked. I didn't even, I didn't know what big law was. I didn't know there was any national, um, I knew there were national law firms, but I didn't know there were firms that kind of stood out among their peers across the country and across the world. Um, I just had no concept of that. I thought, I knew I didn't want to do criminal defense or any, you know, I, I knew I wanted to do corporate transactional law, but um, I really didn't know how the landscape worked. So it was at NYU that I, that I learned that. And it was, you know, I was so, I, I know I just said, Jake, the attorney I was working for in, Orlando, who helped me decide to go to NYU, he didn't really give me all that much color other than you need to go because of the reputational benefits. It was when I got there that I realized, oh, all these firms come to NYU and interview at NYU, and they're fine with students who are, say, top 50% of their class from NYU, uh, whereas they'll only hire top one or 2% of, a, you know, the University mm -hmm. of Florida. So I learned that there and was adaptive and obviously thought, you know, a good, start, a good spot to start a career is obviously in New York, kind of a legal hub of at least the country, if not the world. Um, you can yes. <clears throat> well, that brings us kind of nicely into um, like the topic of networking and how not only going to NYU is the first decision, but then once you're there, how you really um, like utilize every single opportunity or position you're put in to your benefit? Yeah, um, I think that networking is probably the most important uh, piece of getting the job you want, getting into the school you want. I mean, maybe a little less so there. Um, getting the, when you're at a job, getting the actual uh, work that you want and the progression that you want and all of that. Um, because the more people like you, the more they're gonna go out of their way to help you. Uh, the thing I'll say about networking though is I've never been a fan of like the forced, um, you know, happy hour with a company after a day of work or, um, you know, at, at law firms they would, or in law school law firms would come and host like a meet and greet at a bar nearby. Um, certainly good things to go to. For me, I never thought they were 
um, those were the best opportunities for me. I was much more of a self-starter. I would email people who either were University of Florida alum, NYU alum, uh, or just completely out of the blue and say, hey, I'm interested in the firm and want to get to know you. Um, and I found that those one-on-one -on -one conversations outside of any kind of forced or fake social setting um, went further for me. I also find if you go through people, I went through, my fiance Lissa was at medical school when I was interviewing um, for law firms. One of her friends had a really good friend that was at Skadden before I interviewed. And I said, can you put me in touch? And because his name was Eric, Eric was really good friends with this gentleman named Jack at Skadden. I ended up speaking to Jack who said, who are you interviewing with? I said, here's the four people I'm about to interview with. He knew two of them and made a few calls around the firm to, to find out more info on the other two. And I went into an interview because of really one or two phone calls to one of you know, one of my good friends outside, completely outside of Skadden that I have no idea would have this connection. I went into the interview with information that you don't just pull from someone's bio online. And, you know, I went into my first interview with the partner was like, I'm really into running. And he, I knew that he was a runner would have otherwise not known to like, just bring up a topic that he likes. And fortunately for me, I, I do run, I'm not really into it, but um, I was able to connect with them in a way they didn't think I would. Yeah. And people who didn't take that step couldn't. Mm -hmm. Switching gears a little bit. Um... What's your favorite thing about being a lawyer and what are some pros or cons of working in like a more corporate job versus some like we talk about entrepreneurship a lot. So how could you kind of compare the two? For me, a pro, I wouldn't say it's a pro of being a lawyer. I'd say it's a pro of my specific job as an attorney, as a funds, as a funds lawyer. Um, at a firm in New York City, I think a pro is that we have very, very interesting clients. Um, like I said, our clients are sponsor, you know, fund sponsors, hedge fund managers, venture capitalists, um, private equity guys who are very unique, at times demanding, but are always coming to us with very uh, bespoke challenges and very interesting business propositions that they're trying to find a way to paper, if you will. Um, we don't do a lot of just like cookie cutter um, work. And so for me, a pro is that it's always, every assignment I presented with is interesting and different from the last. Um, and they're typically well known, probably not at the time, but they're uh, typically you know, major uh, transactions that are going to occur within the marketplace. Um, so it, it's, it's, I like working on that sort of project and that, um, you know, that size of, of a challenge. Um, a con, I think, of being in corporate America as opposed to you know, working for yourself or starting a business is that um, you know, there's a lot more bureaucracy and politics um, when you have a job like that. Um, at Skadden, I wouldn't necessarily say that I feel it that much, but uh, to give you a direct example, you know, associates progress year by year. It's, there, there's, a, there's a pay scale that's done on a lockstep basis. When you're a first year, you get paid X, second year, third year, fourth year, et cetera. It keeps going um, through eight years. And that is not very um, conducive to somebody who is really ambitious and wants to say, you know, jump ahead uh, or prove themselves on year one of being capable of handling a year three, you know, assignment or job. Um, and so I think across the board, there's kind of this expectation that you progress with your peers. Um, of not, not every company is going to be like that, but that's, that's definitely a con, right? Maya, you skipped years of, you know, high school, skipped years of college. You can't, it doesn't matter how well I do at my job at Skadden, they're not just gonna say, you know, tomorrow, hey, Thomas, you're functioning like a fifth year now, uh, even though you're only a third, we'll bump you up two years, right? Um, that's not going to happen. Um, 
maybe uh, at a well, probably at a smaller firm you could make a move like that, but um, you know that that I see as a con. Do you think there's a lot of parallels between being a lawyer and an entrepreneur? Um, I was doing some research before this, and they, there was like a funny quote that's attorneys are trained in part to help their clients avoid risk, but entrepreneurs kind of knowingly expose themselves to risk. Um, but then they were also kind of telling a lot of the, the parallels. So do you ever find, I mean, you're, you're working as part of a team, but do you find that there's any parallels between the two? <clears throat> yes. Um, <clears throat> I kind of just alluded to this, but the work that I do as an attorney is typically on new and novel ideas, um, which is obviously similar in the entrepreneurial setting in that entrepreneurs are, are typically working on something new or working on, a, on an idea that has a new element or there's, there's some way that they've, you know, um, turned an old idea, uh, you know, less, made something less stagnant and found a way to make money with it, right? So there's going to be probably some element of uh, newness to an idea that they bring to the table. Um, same thing for me, it, it, quite, quite honestly, people wouldn't pay, uh, you know, New York City, uh, Skadden billable rate, if they weren't bringing us a new challenge um, or, or, or kind of a, a tough, first impression legal uh, issue. And so I, I think that's a pretty close parallel. Of course, we're advising them and, and not we're not the one that's actually assuming any risk or, um, you know, potentially facing liability. But um, our, our whole perspective kind of aligns with theirs and that it's new for us. We have to find a way to make, make the law work if we can um, and counsel them through the various you know, decisions they're going to have to make. Yeah, and so on that note, you've had some experience in startups and doing your own thing. So the uh, company that you started for two years, can you tell us a little bit about Yard Slot? Yes. Um, Yard Slot was a peer-to-peer -peer platform. Um, <clears throat> We founded it in 2015, right after I graduated, like it's a year after I graduated undergrad. Um, and it provided, it provided event goers, in our case, um, well, at the time, only uh, college football, college football fans, it provided them a way to make a parking reservation in advance um, somewhere around stadium and it allowed the, the homeowners or students living in a home near near campus uh, to sell their space. So it was just a platform um, like any other peer-to-peer -peer platform where uh, you know one party has a good or a service available and the other wants it. Um, we saw it as a we saw it we saw there being a need at the University of Florida because the way tailgating works there is college students stand on their lawn for you know three hours before game day with a cardboard sign saying 20 30 40 50 100 bucks whatever it is based on how close they were to the stadium and we said man this should there should just be an app for this i mean i would just book it before i came i wouldn't circle around in loops looking for a spot this kid doesn't want to do this either the the student wants nothing more than to go be at their you know tailgate or <laughs> or sleeping in because they played it too hard the night prior right so we saw the need um, at University of Florida firsthand and uh, started there. The next year we went to the rest of the SEC. We went to 14 schools. Um, this is the very abridged version is we, we sold it to a competitor, but um, that sounds, sounds a little different than how it actually went. <laughs> Did you ever need legal advice or consulting in that two years working on your lab? We needed, we needed legal advice. Um, we didn't get it. Uh, I don't know that it, I don't know that I would have gotten it knowing what I know now. Um, 
the issue we ran into is all these all of these schools um, most of the schools in the SEC are in small college towns and most of these small college towns have some local ordinance or rule against parking cars on your lawn and because the way it currently works and still unfortunately today works um, because people just stand out there with a sign and people just give them 20 bucks cash and park and go to the game and leave there's no way for the um, localities to enforce the ordinance or rule. Uh, and so they just let it be. When we came along, um, cities like Gainesville said, oh, look at this. We have this permitting process and people are supposed to pay us 200 bucks a season to be allowed to let people park on their lawn and no one does it. We used to not be able to enforce it and go to every single homeowner and say, give us the 200 bucks. Now we've got this organization and this company that comes in that's got, you know, 50 people, 100 people putting their lot on the site. Let's just tell them they need to make everyone be permitted. Um, and so we started getting challenges from the cities. It started obviously in Gainesville and the next year when we expanded, it was very, we, you know, we were quick to receive um, complaints or, or comment from city officials who, who would just say, you know, we either need to work with you or you can't do this. Um, we didn't get legal advice. We, we essentially took the approach of, we're just a platform. You can go and talk to each of our, our lot owners if you want, um, but we're not involved. And it's very clear on our website that all we do is permit them to do something they're already doing. Um, and that worked to some degree. Um, no one actually sued us. I think we, we received a couple cease and desists. Uh, and then I don't recall exactly what city it was, but one of them went, like actually went to all of our, our lots and, and told them like, you can't do this. So um, varying degree of enforcement, but <laughs> would have been nice to have a legal perspective though we were too young to, you know, for that to have been something we should have paid for at the time, I think. Yeah, something I think people might underestimate is just like how quickly or how important having some legal background is in business. Like I, I would always think, oh, this will be a later on problem. I don't need any you know, legal advice now, but I do think startups at any stage typically run into things sooner than they think. Yeah, and, and I think there are certain things that are worth early legal advice, right? I mean, a lot of this you can search on, yeah. you know, Google and, and, and whatever, right? You can find a lot of this information, but there are important decisions like what sort of an entity you're going to be, um, how many owners are there going to be? Are you going to, you know, say you're a couple years in and you want to bring in another partner, how do you structure the ownership um, such that it, it works right. Um, those are like long-term decisions that if you mess them up, um, you know, you could be creating a big headache for yourself down the road, right? There's, there are tax elections, for example, that you make right after you form an entity that you can't change uh, outside of, you know, in certain circumstances. And so if you make the wrong tax, uh, election or you um you don't don't properly bring someone in as a partner or an owner um you know you could be creating bigger issues down the road um either from a tax perspective or if there's an ownership dispute or whatever else there are some things that you at least want a paper um as best you can and if if you can you know have have an attorney look at them when do you think it's, when do you think you can make that call of like, okay, I can do this myself versus when to bring someone in? I tend to think when you're talking about like ownership in tax, those are times when you want to really consider if it's worth finding an attorney and, and, and making that upfront payment of a few thousand dollars to make mm -hmm. sure everything's good to go down the road, right? Because you never expect to have a dispute with your partner or colleagues or right. co 
whatever. But worst case scenario, you just don't have that paper right, and you end up with you know a, a very expensive lawsuit or legal challenge. Right. In the well, the last question I have is, what are three quick tips you could give to someone starting a business today? Well, the the first. The first is kind of like what we just said. I would say that people should, um, if they don't get a lawyer when they're starting a business, they should take the time to do the research themselves because most of this stuff that a lawyer is going to counsel you through at the early stages can be found online. Um, there are nuances. And so the more complex your you know, business idea is, the more you might want to seek a lawyer. Um, but if you're just starting, you know, a widget company, they would call it, right? Where you just sell some sort of product and you just need to find out what sort of business entity makes the most sense and you're the sole owner or whatever else, that stuff, take the time to look, look it up and do it right um, so that you don't have, you know, you don't over, you don't make it more complicated than it needs to be down the road by, by just doing it wrong, right? Um, I would also say, you need to be extremely honest with yourself. Um, and that probably goes both from the legal and entrepreneurial perspective. Um, we were very honest with ourselves at, after the second year of yard slot in saying, we're not putting the time in that we need to, to make this thing work. It's clearly not our top priority anymore. Um, I was at law school. The other co-founders were, you know, in different parts of the country and we really weren't putting in the time. We were honest with ourselves and that resulted in us being able to exit with, uh, you know, a quote unquote sale as opposed to, uh, you know, half-assing it for another year or two years and exiting with you know, a quote unquote you know, failure or business collapse or just dissolution, right? Um, we, we knew we weren't putting in the time necessary, but we found a way to make it work from um, a go forward, you know, on a go forward basis, right? Uh, selling a business to a competitor looks a lot better than, uh, you know, we realized there were a lot more challenges that we weren't expecting and <laughs> ran into the ground over two years. So I'd say you, you need to be really honest with yourself. Um, and then on honesty, I would also say as kind of a third tip, you need to be brutally honest with your attorneys, um, both, both about what you want to accomplish. And if you're ever in a situation, uh, where, where you're needing them to represent you in, um, a more personal manner, really honest with what has actually occurred. And the quick explanation there would be, if, so if you're, if you're talking to an attorney on behalf of your business and you just say, uh, hey, we wanna form another entity to make this investment. If you don't give them context and background on what you're actually trying to do, all they can do is form you that entity. But if you tell them, hey, we're trying to make this investment in the Cayman Islands, and apparently we have to have a Cayman Islands vehicle, can we form it to do that? The lawyer can then say, oh, well, hold on. You can't just get around that rule by forming a Cayman Island entity that's completely owned by you know, your current Delaware entity or whatever. I know I'm getting into the weeds, but if you don't tell them that, if you're not open with that, they can't counsel you on potential issues. And the whole benefit of having a lawyer is for them to know your business in and out and tell you, you, you know, ways that you can maximize profit and, uh, you know, accomplish all your objectives. So be open and honest on the, on the flip side, if they're representing you in an individual capacity because of some wrongdoing, um, if you withhold information, they obviously can't represent you to the fullest extent. Um, and it's never going to hurt unless you're telling them that, you're, you know, an ongoing threat or something to, to society, in which case I would still hope you would tell them that way we can get you off the streets, but um, <laughs> you just want to inform, inform your lawyers. Yeah, that's good advice. Same with, same with, uh, I think that's true for a lot of things too, but like 
um, we can't do our jobs. We can't market the, yep. the client as well if we don't know the full story. And um, I'm sure it's relevant in your world. Yeah, well. She like tells me the full story on her speeding tickets. And then <laughs> I know. I wonder what the judges would see. <laughs> That's another tip, right? People think that you need to be an attorney to get out of speeding tickets. That's not true, right? Sheila, I just tell you, I, I, I suggest some language, right? And all you're really doing is sending an email to the court saying, hey, I got this speeding ticket. You know, I'm a productive, helpful member of society and I have an otherwise good record. Can you please show me some leniency? And they do, yeah. right? No one takes, no one does that. No one sends a letter, right? I'm not sending letters on behalf of Sheila, Sheila does that. Well, thank you so much, Thomas, for taking the time to be on an episode of Clock Combos. We've been really excited to get your episode in as well. Um, Sheila and I was, were laughing when we made this episode, like how much money we would have hypothetically owed you for like random bits of legal advice or just questions here and there. Um, so yeah, thanks for talking with us this morning. Thank you. You can uh, pay me when your businesses uh, continue to boom. Thanks guys so much for watching. We're going to be releasing episodes weekly and we're trying to hit the bar. So we're going to peace out. Be sure to like, subscribe, all the other things, all the social medias. Comment, share, retweet, copy, paste, link. Isn't that the TikTok thing? Just full send it. Get it done. Get it done. Get us some likes, guys. Hope you guys enjoy. <laughs>